Uh, next weekend is our conference. And I'm going to be like a broken tape recorder, but I'm going to say it again because I'm very excited because we're going to have some awesome announcements next weekend for this conference. And then our CDs, our songs will be uh, for sale. So something we are super excited and then a lot of other things that will be happening. And so a um, uh, few churches are coming, but I don't know how and where they're going to fit. This is going to be probably the last conference that we are going to have in this building. And so other conferences are going to be in other places. But for now, we're going to still keep it here. And we're going to pack it and uh, have an awesome, awesome time. Amen. If you have not been water baptized, but you have made a decision to follow Jesus, I would really ask you, your next step right now will be to give your life to the Lord in water baptism. So on Friday at 8 o'clock, all of us gather here for classes, different classes for mentorship, for home groups. There's 20 probably different classes going on here. And so there's a class for you. Um, and then you need to come and learn a little bit more about it so you can get baptized on this conference. Now, uh, if you've given your life to Jesus and you're saying that you're not ready to get baptized, the Bible gives us two prerequisites for baptisms. Repent from our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible doesn't tell you you have to get a Lamborghini and you have to get a promotion in your job, get a husband, your dog needs to get healed, you know, your sprinklers need to be fixed, everything, and then you need to get baptized. No, these two things, repentance and belief in Jesus Christ. And if you met those prerequisites, you are ready to get baptized. If you were an infant and you were carried to a priest and somebody sprinkled you with holy water, that doesn't count. That is a great thing. You can come for our prayer lines, get sprinkled also with the anointing water, but that's not baptism. That's a blessing, deliverance. Well, real baptism is when you're an adult, you made a decision to follow Jesus and you make a conscious decision to get submerged in water, not just sprinkled. Amen? With those announcements out of the way, let's go to third epistle of John and verse 2. Constantly we refer to this verse in our church. Third epistle of John and verse 2. Beloved. Turn to your neighbor and say, Beloved. This is a wonderful word to use. Beloved. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you prosper. And I hope you're generous with your prosperity. I pray that you may prosper in all things. Somebody say all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. I want to speak today on a topic that will be called threefold blessing. Threefold blessing. When we in Adam committed sin and we fell from God. Sin did not only affect our relationship with God, that it killed that relationship. Sin not only affected that it, we were separated from God, but what sin did is sin also brought a lot of other problems in our world. Sin brought sickness and disease. Sin brought suffering. Sin brought hate. Sin brought problems and conflicts in families. Sin brought shame. Sin brought guilt. And also sin brought curse. God said that from now on because sin is in the world, man will not have ground produce fruits and vegetables by default. The ground will produce thistles and thorns by default and man will have to work in the sweat of a brow to be able to achieve something and his efforts will be much but the results will be little. So we see that sin didn't just affect our spirit, it affected our soul, it affected our bodies because we started to get old and we started to die. We were not intended to die. God didn't create us with death. God created us to live forever on this earth. And then sin brought suffering and it brought financial problems into this world. Now my Bible makes me to understand that where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. So it would make sense that if sin came and it affected every area of my life, 
that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ upon coming into our world that it will not only affect our relationship with God but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ since grace abounds more than sin if sin spread like virus affecting my health affecting the finances affecting my relationship with God then the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ it would be logical it would make sense since the grace is greater than sin it will also do in those areas where sin damaged things and even more. Comprende? Okay. Why am I saying that? Because I am a firm believer that Jesus Christ died on the cross not only to give you a free ride to heaven. He died on the cross to bring not only re restoration in your relationship with God but to bring healing to our physical body to bring freedom from demons curses nightmares addictions and to provide for us also like Paul but John says here prosperity in all things now many people have no problem and we have accustomed we heard probably Jesus came and died so you will have a relationship with God and that is true 150 percent true but Jesus Christ also died for other things just as grace is greater than sin light is greater than the darkness Jesus is stronger than Satan God's goal and God's plan and God's vision for your life is not just undo one aspect of sin through the Calvary but undo everything sin did and even more everything sin did and even more you may say well does that mean that we're not going to die in Christ our death is we move from one world to another in Christ we experience healing in Christ we experience provision in Christ we experience blessing in Jesus name can somebody say amen now write down those three three simple blessings that we find in Jesus Christ from this verse one is we find our spiritual success or our spiritual status write down spiritual success in here Apostle John says that I pray that your soul will prosper spiritual success the first blessing that Jesus Christ purchased on the Calvary the first blessing Jesus Christ wants you to prosper in is in your spiritual life that you're spiritually successful spiritual world is real you know I grew up in Ukraine and 15 years ago well in the year 1999 December 6th my family immigrated to United States after a few years and they've achieved a green card and then a few years later I went and passed the test and I became the citizen of United States I believe the greatest country on the planet earth I get a chance to visit Ukraine once in a while and I come there as an American I burned my Ukrainian passport a long time ago <laughs> And I come there as an American. It's funny how when I'm there people think of me as an American. When I'm here they think of me as Russian. I don't fit in neither worlds. I always feel rejected. <laughs> I just have to overcome there through the blood of Jesus. In Jesus name. But when I come back to America, you have to understand that this is my home. This is where I belong. It's not where I was born, but it's where I belong. I have a passport. I have a house here and I have life here I don't see my life anywhere outside uh, this is where my life is and that's where I belong even when I am in Ukraine and I am there for some kind of a schooling or other things my heart and where I belong is in the United States and I cannot wait to get back home you have to understand you live in the physical world right now but at the same time you live and you belong to a spiritual world the same way I can be in Ukraine but I belong in the United States the same way is with you you live in the physical world surrounded with things that you can see but you belong to a spiritual world and actually you do belong to a spiritual world inside of you is a spirit inside of you is a soul inside of you I can prove to you God exists if you ever doubt that God exists ask yourself this question do I exist? Ask yourself this question. 
are my thoughts real because they can't be seen there's no microscope in the world that can see your thoughts but we both know you have thoughts I hope we do I hope you do you have a mind if you don't believe you have a mind well Jesus have mercy on you but you do have a mind you have a mind you can shut your mouth and you can think and plan and no one will know what's going on in your world and that world that you are planning and thinking that is the world that's real you because on the day of your death when we will come and attend your funeral and there will be your corpse laying in the casket all of the body parts will be there the only thing that's going to be missing is you that means real you is not the body you see in the mirror real you is the one inside that no microscope can see that you cannot see by cutting you into pieces and you're not hidden somewhere in the bone or in the blood the real you is the invisible therefore you already are in the spiritual world you are already a spiritual being and therefore for you to doubt God is for you to doubt yourself and if you doubt yourself well you're in deep deep confusion if you doubt that you or your thoughts are not real that your motives are not real and maybe you watch too much inception movies and you're thinking maybe you're in some kind of a dream I would highly recommend prayer line some people get so so deep into philosophy that they're like maybe we are not real right now maybe we are like sleeping right now no you can poke yourself with the needle if it hurts you're not sleeping you are fully awake you are a spiritual world can somebody say amen in the spiritual world there is three types of things in the spiritual world in the spiritual world you are either a prisoner a poor person or in the spiritual world you are a prosperous person just like in America for example United States occupies five percent of earth's population but the United States has 25 percent of world's criminals in our prisons so a lot of people in America just because you are in America does not necessarily mean that you are a prosperous person people think if I come to America I become rich actually there is a very high chance if you come to America you might be in a prison because America has a highest rate incarceration rate in the whole world so your higher chance is actually ending up in the Benton County Jail and ending up on the Forbes list in the spiritual world many people are in bondage means their spirit life their invisible life is addicted and it's bound by devil and it's bound by the demons so the question is not whether you are in the spiritual world the question is who are you in the spiritual world a prisoner a poor person or a prosperous person God wants you in the spiritual world not to be a prisoner of demons curses and the devil and God wants you in the spiritual world not just to be a poor person meaning that you just simply live your life as though God does not exist live your life religiously little check mark I prayed little check mark I read the Bible little check mark I fasted little check mark I gave my 10% when I felt like it little check mark I came to church when I wasn't busy and you're looking at yourself you're like man I am doing good spiritually no you're doing good religiously but to do good spiritually you have to do something not something more but there has to be something more there than just religious activities that Buddhists do Muslims do Hindus do and so many other religions do and some of them are even more successful in the religion and in the relationship in the spiritual world than we are to be prosperous spiritually what does it mean it means to be a disciple of the Holy Spirit so that you can dominate your natural world to be prosperous spiritually means you are disciple of the Holy Spirit so you can influence your world the one that you are living in to be prosperous spiritually does not just mean having a devotional life though that is important it's not just speaking in tongues though that is extremely important it's not just giving it's important it's not just inviting people to church highly important 
well you can do all of these things and not be under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not be in partnership with the Holy Spirit you are a spiritual being you have thoughts which cannot be seen and you have to belong connect to the world that is invisible it's completely normal completely cool and it's completely trendy Hindus do that do you know why Hindus Buddhists and so many religions meditation and a lot of the uh, the Eastern practices and even a lot of the yoga things that they do all of these things where they connect to a spiritual world and a lot of them even get results some of them see healings I met one Muslim guy and I remember I was telling him I'm like you Muslims are going to hell because you don't have miracles he's like my grandpa raised person from the dead I was like never mind you guys are going to hell because for other reasons <laughs> But you can't come up to other religions and use this whole idea well you guys are not real religion because you guys don't have miracles you'll be shocked and surprised of the miracles the Hindus will tell you about why do they have these miracles because they are understand understanding their spiritual and they connect to spiritual powers now unfortunately it's not the power of the Holy Spirit it's the power of the enemy who does certain limited miracles of course at the expense of taking things that our life depends on we as Christians must live a successful spiritual life. Spiritual world created natural world. Spiritual world can control natural world. Spiritual world can accelerate natural world. Spiritual world can neutralize natural world. Spiritual world can reverse natural world. Natural world, the one we see is at the mercy of the world we don't. The world you see is at the mercy of the world you don't. And the world you don't see is the world you are in right now with your heart, your thoughts and your mind. Who you really are is not a visible person. What you see right now, your skin and that's why you can never base your self-esteem on your appearance. So what? You gain 10 pounds. That's not who you are. And this is not just positive little thinking that you have to tell yourself to make yourself feel good. No, that is actually who you are. If you don't believe it, take a look at the picture of someone loved who passed away and look at them. That's not them. That is not who you are, what you see in the mirror or on a weight scale. The real you is the invisible, cannot be seen by natural eye. And you are in that world right now. The question is, who are you connected in that world? Are you alone just flying over there or are you connected to the Holy Spirit? because more likely you are not just alone there you are either in the Holy Spirit or you in some other weird spirits that are not producing blessing and joy in your life it is the will of God in a spiritual world God didn't create spiritual world when Jesus died God created spiritual world when he created you the Bible says he took his hands out and he made you out of dust everything else God created he made it with his mouth when it came to you he made you with his hands that already tells you something God created you with his touch that's why you're never satisfied until you receive his touch in your life because it was his touch that brought you into this world it will be his touch that will sustain you that's why we always want to be touched that's why we always want to have somebody to hold us touch us and that someone has to be God no boyfriend is going to touch you in the way that God wants to touch you nobody else can do that but Jesus can somebody say amen so God creates a body but that body was just a corpse. What we see on the funerals is exactly what was with Adam. Until God came and the Bible says God, he took his spirit, what God was inside of God and he breathed that inside of me, inside of you. And the Bible says and the man became living soul. How did you become alive? When God put inside of your corpse, dead body, something invisible himself part of himself his spirit that's why you're made in the likeness of God because as something out of God's spirit came and it dwelt in you that is who you are that's why we pray why because we connect to the one who created us that's why we fast and when you begin to fast something begins to happen not only you're shedding pounds but you're also beginning to see that your spirit becomes more alive. You become more sharp. Your prayers like laser is stronger. When you give, when you bring people to church, when you, when you do all of these things, what happens? Your spiritual life, it becomes more awakened. God wants you to prosper in your spiritual supernatural life. Amen. 
for you to spend time with Holy Spirit has to be as natural as it has become to watch Netflix, scroll to Snapchat, Instagram or all, all other things that are going on there. It is natural for you to spend time with the Holy Spirit. You may not know how to pray, you know how to think. You may not know how to pray, you know how to talk. And some of us, <laughs> that is the only thing that's running in our life is our mouth. <laughs> Everything else is not. <laughs> And then it gets so zipped when we come to prayer. We don't know what to say. And we leave the prayer. It's like a broken tape. It keeps Something always comes coming out. Prayer is a time. I want to invite each one of you to spend time with Holy Spirit. Spend time with Holy Spirit throughout the day. Let it be. Prayer is not about prayer. Prayer is about connecting and building your spiritual life. You may say, well, I'm just not one of those like religious fanatics. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a mind? Yes. You are already fanatic you're already supernatural you're already you are there's part of you that's invisible no scientist can see no microscope can see and that is who you are the invisible you is that is who you are and John says in here I pray your soul will prosper that's why I pray that's why I, sometimes I can spend long hours in prayer for the same reason I can spend long hours with my wife that is not weird that is completely normal same thing can happen with God not because I'm a pastor but because I am a person who has an eternal hungry soul that didn't come from Krishna, Muhammad or Buddha. It came from Jehovah the Creator and it longs for that. It craves for that. I can shove it with drugs. I can shove it with liquor. I can shove it with porn. I can shove it with relationships with good things or bad things but at the end it's like a bottomless hole. Nobody can ever fill it except the one who created it. You will never be happy. You will never be fully satisfied. You have to know why. Because you didn't originate just from toys. You originated from God Himself. And until you go back to Him who created you, you don't find that joy. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, and not only God wants us to be spiritually successful, God wants us to be in good health. In good health. Let me give you just three things that health, health comes from. There's many things but I'll just give you three main ones. First one, health comes from happiness or positive emotions. The Bible says, merry heart does good as medicine but a crushed spirit, it rottens the bones or destroys the bones. It, it, it hurts us. These are not just allegories. These are not metaphors where God is saying, well, if you're happy, uh, you know, it's like medicine. No, it's actually for reals that if you are happy, you are going to be healthy. I've heard cases where people had cancer and the doctor was recommending to them to watch joke not jokes but humor and humor and comedy and there were cases where people watched that for days and they laughed themselves until their stomach was hurting and they were completely cured of all the cancer cells. People who are sad, depressed, bitter, self-pity, offended, easily, easily angered. They're always, you have to walk on eggshells around them. You have to understand one thing. You're like a magnet telling all of the diseases in the world, come and find your friend. Sicknesses are attracted to negativity. Sicknesses are attracted to sadness, depression. The Bible clearly states if you want to be healthy, God is not just interested in bringing healing into your life. God is interested in bringing health into your life and to be healthy you have to make a decision to be happy. Happiness is not a result. Stop letting people determine your happiness. Stop letting barista determine your happiness at the coffee shop. Stop letting the lady who drives in front of you determine your happiness. Stop letting your husband determine your happiness. Stop letting your life determine your happiness. You wake up in the morning and you make up your mind, I am a happy person. And everybody else has to believe in that. Because if you wake up in the world and people say, well, I'm going to see how this day will be. Oh, that day will give you some pleasant surprises. And give you, will give you a million things to be depressed about. In the morning when you wake up, especially those of you who come for morning prayers. The moment the alarm goes up and the right way the devil comes at you and says, you're so miserable. Why in the world are you joined the hungry generation? What did God in the pastor's head to make people wake up so early and all of these things? Do you think I don't have those thoughts? I have them every day. First two minutes, that's why I lay in the bed and I fight. And this is what I tell myself. I'm the happiest person in the world. I feel great. 
I am blessed, I am prosperous, I'm good looking, I am anointed, everything is awesome. Do you think I feel better after that? No, I don't. <laughs> but it helps me to get up. And after I get up, it helps me to feel better 15 minutes later. But I do refuse to let someone else choose my happiness. My happiness is my choice. I only have one life to live and I'm not putting my happiness into your hands. I love you, but you won't make the decision whether I'll be happy or not. Can somebody say amen? You have to make the decision. If you will be happy, if you will be choose to be happy, even when you're in pain, even when you're suffering, the Bible says rejoice. I say again, Paul says rejoice. And he said that when he was in prison, Paul was not in Cancun enjoying a vacation. Paul was in prison, his life was hard and Paul says rejoice. Rejoice is a command. It's not look at how you feel, you choose to obey God. You say, God, today I'm going to rejoice. Why? Because you said so. You walk around with this stingy, stiff face rejoicing. Well, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. Amen. The second way we get health is through honor. When we begin to honor our authorities, when we begin to honor people that God places in our life, we actually become healthy. You may be surprised out of the Ten Commandments, the only commandment God says that has a reward and this is a very peculiar reward. This is the reward. It will be well with you and you will live a long life. If you want to be well with, that's not proper English, but if you want things to be well with you and you want to live a long life, I'm going to give you a small secret. Honor those in authority. Don't pick fights with your boss. If you're a wife, Submit to your husband. If you live with your parents, honor them. If you have a home group leader or a pastor or if you have a boss, be respectful. And God promises if you honor those in authority, as a bonus, God promises to do two things for you. Make you be well with and live a long life. Now if you do not want to live a long life, ask God to transfer that to me. I'll take it. You need to live a long life. Some people saying, I don't want to live a long life. Maybe you don't want to live a long life right now. It's completely fine. But your life is going to get better. And when it gets better, you would want to live long. But if you dishonor authorities, when your life gets better and God sends an angel, say, take him home. And you say, Lord, I just 10 more years. And God says, you should have started thinking about that when you were a teenager. You should have honored your mom and dad. You should have vacuumed. You should have washed the dishes. You should have taken care. You should have listened to Pastor Vlad. You should have listened to those things. Now you got to go home early. Why? Because you were disrespectful. This actually in the Bible. If you're disrespectful to authorities, you're going to live a short life. Now that doesn't mean that every person who lives a short life didn't honor his parents. And it doesn't mean every person that lives a long life did. Some people live a long life, but it's a miserable one. But God wants to give you a life where you live long, but it's a good life. Can somebody say amen? And the third thing that brings us health is healing. Is when Christ wants to make us healed. Jesus Christ is interested not only in healing you, but he's also interested in giving you good health. And many times when you have sickness that the doctors can't help, that the medicine can't help, we as Christians, we believe in faith. Where we put our trust in Jesus, we pray and we see God heal people. We see God heal people here and we see God people even our own selves. I remember I had a, an itch that was um, a scratch that was developed on my, uh, on my elbows. Every time I would take hot showers and I'm one of those people who doesn't like hot showers. I like boiling hot showers. And so and I would take the shower and afterwards I would come and it, it would be this red spots on my, on my elbows and then it would itch really bad and so and I would scratch it and it would develop into these little things that look like ringworm and so I kept ignoring it and ignoring it until it starts spreading on both of my elbows and it kept itching more and more every time I took a shower and then there was this red spot like like almost like hot red red spots on my elbows and so that's when I decided to start looking into <laughs> native medicine and so I remember I had a Skype home group and then my Skype home group said, hey guys, I showed them my Skype home group said, hey, I have this problem. Did anybody have this problem before? And the guy's like, oh yeah, I did. You should do this. You should take an onion and just rub it with an onion. One guy is garlic and the other guy's like, hey, you should take this and do that. So I just wrote about five things that I can do with this. So I took one 
and it spread I'm like it didn't work number two and I took literally that's what I did I just do, do, kept applying different medicine until I taped it over the night and I guess it made it worse so next morning I wake up and my hand on both on one side is swollen and by 12 o'clock it's swollen so big that I'm lifting and I feel like there's like a lot of jello here and it keeps getting bigger I'm like oh, holy smoke this is not good I'm gonna die and so I went to the doctor I told the doctor you know what's going on and the doctor asked me what did I do and I told him all the medicine he applied he said that's not medicine he said what you did is he said you had just infected your blood with things he said you're gonna destroy yourself like this and so he gave me a few few simple things my swelling went down but the itching didn't stop red spots didn't stop anytime I take shower it would itch still and months later it would continue my wife would ask me say Vlad what's going on and I kept laying my hands every morning on that hand and I just kept declaring God this is going away I am not because the doctor is like the only way this will go away is if you take cold showers I'm like it's gonna get cold in hell before I start taking cold showers not in America taking cold showers I'm not in some third world countries I will not deny myself those privileges it's my God-given rights I kept laying my hands on my elbows and I kept declaring honestly it took one year and they were still there those red spots would show up but I knew one thing it's a matter of time and those things that infection is going to be gone and it's been now one year no problem whatsoever I take showers as hot as I want to nothing itches everything is fine and I give God all the glory he wants to heal you but he also wants you to be a person who values your health. Be in good health means God is not just interested in healing you. He's also interested in giving you health. How do you stay healthy? You eat right. How do you stay healthy? You sleep not too much and not too little. How do you stay healthy? You live a life of fasting. It means when you take time where you don't eat at all and trust me you won't die. Everything will be fine. How do you stay healthy? Is you exercise. Now in the days of Jesus you did not need to exercise because they didn't have cars. In the days of Jesus they didn't have offices where you sat all day and did nothing but drink your pop. But in these days you do have to exercise because if you don't next thing that happens because of our work and because of all of these things we develop problems physically. And so God wants you to be in good health not just value healing but also value your health drinking vitamins going working out going and doing some cardio or running or walking being athletic going and doing those things these things are spiritual because God values your health many people begin to value their health when it's too late when it's too late especially as young people value your health today it's a gift from God after your salvation the most important gift after your salvation is not your car and it's not even your boyfriend it's not even your children it's your health because if you don't have a health your children don't have a father your wife doesn't have a husband your parents don't have a child can somebody say amen and lastly prosper in all things so God wants us to have spiritual success God wants us to have good health and God wants us to prosper in all things I'll write these thoughts down prosperity is not what you have it's who you are prosperity is not what you have it's first of all who you are you probably have heard a study that we've shared many times in our church where they took five millionaires and they made them homeless and they took five homeless people and they made them millionaires they wanted to do the study and to see how millionaires will do being homeless and how homeless people will do having a million dollars and within a few years they found out that all the millionaires who became homeless bounced back and became millionaires again and they found out that all the people all the five people who were homeless who received a million dollars within a short period of time end up in the same place as before homeless and they came to the conclusion that being a millionaire has very little to do with having a million dollars it has a lot to do with having a million dollar mind to be prosperous in the area of finances you must understand it has to do with who you are first instead of just the money you have or things that you have education that you have the position that you have or the things that you aspire to have it has to do with who you are I want you to write down number two about prosperity you cannot be rich if you keep making poor decisions nobody can make a prosperous life 
with poor decisions. Many people have poor decisions. Part of being poor in the head is when you make poor decisions. Part of being poor in the head is when your decision making mechanism is so messed up. The decisions you make are so poor. Now you can't escape poverty without poor decisions. Poverty is of the devil. Poverty is a curse. It's not a blessing from God. That does not mean that people who are poor are second-class Christians or people who are poor don't love God because there's a lot of people in the world that are poor and a lot of times we go through poverty but poverty is not from God. I was in Tanzania and I saw what poverty does to people. When I came to a youth camp meeting and I asked them what are the struggles the young people are suffering. So I thought I'm going to prepare them a message on the identity in Jesus Christ. They said well they're so broke that an average girl would sleep with any guy just to get a bar of soap. For a lotion, a girl would sleep with a married man because things are so poor and she has nothing to offer. She can't work, there is no work and people can't pay her with anything. So the only thing she does is she, she goes and sleeps with a man. If you think poverty is noble, go to other countries and you see how noble it is. Violence, that's why all the poor neighborhoods, we know there's violence there. We don't move into poor neighborhoods, why? Is it because the houses are worse? No, because that's where usually a lot of crime and a lot of these things because poverty it brings bad things. It's not from God. Now we can be poor and be Christians but at the same time in our mind we can't be poor. In our mind we have to know it is the will of God to make us prosper and many people who are poor today they've made poor decisions. Why they made poor decisions? Because the Bible says if we meditate in God, God will help us to prosper here and prosper in our decision mechanism and will help us to make proper decisions which will lead to prosperity. A lot of times in America you don't have to have high education. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't hang out with those who do, don't sleep with somebody, and graduate out of high school, do be disciplined, don't love too much of sleep but love morning prayers and you will find how by default you will be prosperous. Without higher education, business ideas, you will have more than enough. A lot of people who find themselves in poverty situations, you will link it, it's not like out of the another planet, poverty just came in and chased them down. It's poor decision after poor decision after poor decision after poor decision after poor decision. Poverty is the consequence of poor decisions. Poor decisions are the consequence of a poverty mindset. And poverty mindset is a consequence of not allowing God's word to dwell richly inside of our mind. Can somebody say amen? Bible gives us seven rules that govern poverty. One. The first one is laziness. The second one is withholding tithes. The third one is hating correction. The fourth one is loving sleep. The fifth one is addictive behavior. Next one is stealing. And the last one is hastening to be rich quick. So Bible tells us these kind of habits always lead to poverty. And these kind of habits are usually one of them or many are found in poor people. Not poor financially, poor mentally. Because you can be having enough but having these kind of habits. People who are lazy, people who hate correction. You're about to go buy the vehicle and everybody tells you, listen, that might not be the best deal. No, because I got a five dollar for five cent raise in my work and I need to get a new vehicle. Or same thing happens with loving sleep. People instead of loving prayer, they love sleep and they sleep like a bear in the winter. The Bible clearly says people who love sleep will not prosper. That's as simple as that. And that is the laws that govern poverty. This is in the Bible. People who say God is against prosperity. Well if you obey the Bible, these things naturally lead to a life of prosperity. Addictive behavior. That means if you sleep with anything that moves, you're gonna have unwanted pregnancies. Which means you have to drop out of school. Which next thing, at least you don't finish college. If you begin to drink, you're gonna get a DUI. If you get a DUI, well they take your license and it's gonna be six thousand dollars. At six thousand dollars you can put a down payment on a house. And then you're trying to get a place, you can't get a place, they crank up your rent and one thing leads to another. Guys, these are the things that poor decisions lead to poverty. The Bible says stealing. 
when we begin to cheat when we begin to sell things to people we know it's broken but they don't know that so we remove a light bulb out of a dashboard or we, we just simply say hey they didn't ask for it they didn't ask the details it is their job and we give something to someone that is not good and next thing that happens the bible says it's what poor people do and hastening to be rich quick it's when you scroll through the tv and they this guy comes up with a happy smile and some beautiful chick and that they're, they're in hawaii and they're saying that if you follow their program in three months you will make sixty thousand dollars that's what poor people do because in three months you can get in debt with sixty thousand dollars you're most likely not gonna get sixty thousand dollars and if you'll get you'll know what to do with them god wants you <laughs> God wants you to be the person who does not make poor decisions. God's word is so important. Church is so important. Not just God's not going to drop money in heaven. God drops his word in your mind. It changes how you think. It changes decisions that you make and then it brings prosperity. You know when I was 21, when I was 20 years of age and I, I started to fill my mind with God's word. Um, I have a high school diploma. I uh, didn't have, I started going to a Bible college and financially I was receiving very little from the church and I should have not been a prosperous person. I didn't have much knowledge but I filled myself with this and I made few decisions in my life. I don't drink, too expensive, can't afford that habit. I don't smoke. I need my liver to work fine and I want to live long and if God wants me to smoke him build a chim chimney on the top of my head, he didn't do that. I don't use drugs. They're illegal. I don't want to get busted. That is wrong. And I will only sleep with the person I'm married to. I don't want to get lawsuits. I don't want to pay child support. I, I, these things, they're money wasters. I can't do that. I'm a, from a financial standpoint of view, if I wouldn't be a Christian, from a financial standpoint of view, holiness is the only way to live prosperous. And I made those decisions as a young person. My parents helped me to make those decisions. And then at the age of 21, I remember that God, through reading books, through reading the Word of God, my mind started to be opened up about taking extra money. And instead of buying new shoes, instead of buying video games, and instead of buying new rims on the car, to look where I can throw my money so my money can make me more money. I don't know where that got into my head with the high school diploma. But it got in there. And instead of buying a new car, one of my uncles recommended to me, he said, Vlad, be wise. Go buy a rental property and let the rental property pay for your new car. And this way you have a rental property and the car. I'm like, sounds brilliant. And that's what I did. I had a new car that I wasn't paying for. The rental property was paying for. And I was an immigrant here in the United States and I see sometimes people who have everything going for them but because they don't dwell in God's Word they make poor decisions and these poor decisions lead them to poverty at the age of 22 years old you're supposed to be having a bright future and you talk to a gentleman and you see how much debt they have 19 years old you're a young lady you're supposed to be just finished high school with your associate's degree and you talk to them and it's as though that they've traveled the world 25 times i'm like what did you do to accumulate that debt and you quickly find out poor decisions which result in poverty in the head which result in not spending time in god's word to digest and change your thinking and change your life can somebody say amen i want you to write down the last few uh, thoughts about uh, prosperity is the prosperity to prosper you must apply yourself to some for, form of income producing activity income producing activity Peter was fishing Joseph was in management Abraham was farming Paul did tents the Bible says God gives power to get wealth the Bible doesn't say God gives wealth it means God gives us ideas God gives inspiration God blesses the works of our hands that means you got to do something you can't sit at home and simply say well I'm just gonna sit here and watch you know sermons and God is just gonna bless me now he will provide for you by welfare and some other things but if you really want to prosper you're gonna have to get out of your blessed assurance Jesus is mine and go get a job you're gonna have to do something that produces income and lastly is prosperity will come after you handle hard times with care and poverty many times will come when we handle our good times carelessly when you're going through a hard time handle your hard time with care if you look at the guys in the bible like joseph he was going through a very hard time but because he handled it right 
it led him into prosperity if you look at Peter he was going through a hard time couldn't catch anything but because he handled it correctly he didn't drop the boat and ran he let Jesus use his boat and Jesus gave him a word and Peter was so emotionally exhausted but he still obeyed Jesus and then he prospered Israel went through the wilderness 40 years but because they handled that wilderness correctly those people entered into prosperity you see three Hebrew boys they were just given the chance to deny God and to compromise their faith but they said no we're not going to compromise our faith for the sake of our boss we're going to still honor God and respect our boss and you know what they didn't get fired they didn't get criticized or screamed at they got thrown into the fire I mean this is worse than whatever you and I get treated sometimes in our workplace some people complain well my workplace is so stressful <laughs> three Hebrew boys would have wished to have your stress because their stress involved being thrown into the fire but they said you know what we're gonna handle this hard time with care guess what happens a few hours later they got out of the fire and the king says well guys there's gonna be a jump in your pay and right away promotion came the faith that they had was spread all around the continent all around the kingdoms God wants to prosper you but you must understand when you go through hard times you have to handle them with care if in your hard times you quit on God if in your hard times you go into drinking if in your hard time you drop and you snap and you break it and you begin to treat your wife with disrespect if in your hard times when you're in school and you can't go through school and you're saying you know what I just quit I'm just done I'm just gonna go you know work at McDonald's or something that is my life if you quit that God cannot prosper you be a person who has a perseverance be a tough person tough times don't last tough people do outlast your tough times and you will prosper and God will bless you can somebody say amen